Have you ever thought, why don't they teach that in school? As a teacher of 23 years myself, I noticed that students had less and less of some of the basic skills they needed for everyday life. You know, things like how to write a thank you note, how to make a phone call, how to apologize, how to write a check and balance your account, how to sew on a button, how to clean the bathroom and vacuum and do laundry, how to operate a fire extinguisher, how to turn off the water to the house. And thus, Adulting 101 was born. You can go to jamesdevine.net, click on the Adulting 101 course link, and take a view of a few free lessons. And if you like what you see, sign up for the full course, and you can get 30% off as a Cool Grandpa listener. Just enter the code COOLGRANDPA at checkout. Hey folks, I want to talk to you about this application radio. I strongly recommend radio to help grandparents and parents read to their grandchildren remotely when they can't be in the same room. Whether you're living across the country, across the world, or you're just gone on a business trip, radio makes it easy for you to read to those young ones when you're away. It's a super easy tool that allows for video monitoring across the top of the screen so they can see you and you can see them, as well as having the book prominently displayed, making it easy for you to read to those young ones, or better yet, having them read to you. What I want you guys to do is go to cool-grandpa.us, look for the affiliate link for Radio, click on that link, and sign up today for your free trial. Hi, I want to introduce to you guys Sylvia Leal. Now, Sylvia is a person that I found and connected with through her book, A Morning with Grandpa. As I got to talking with Sylvia, I learned she had these fascinating stories about her grandfathers that had served in the Nationalist Chinese Army back in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. We dive into this conversation and talk about the background and the impact that her grandfathers had. And then we talk about Sylvia's interests and her background growing up in Caracas, Venezuela, immigrating to the U.S., her college experience, going to work as an environmental lawyer, and then transitioning over into doing illustrations and and writing uh, children's books. So you guys are in for a treat. This is a really exciting and very interesting conversation about grandfathers again, whom the granddaughter never personally met, but has been impacted by them in such a big way. You guys are really going to be in for a treat. One thing that we're doing that's a little bit different is we put a little bit of an addendum at the end of this because we wanted to talk and and make sure that we got the facts straight about her mother's father. uh, That's Lieutenant General Fan Hanji. And what we did was we we went through the conversation, but then we went back, put the addendum in place where we corrected some of the dates, places, names. And we wanted to do that to make sure that we were honoring her grandfather and trying to get his story as straight as and, and factual as we as we could. So at the end of this, make sure you listen through the addendum. And again, you guys are really going to enjoy meeting Sylvia and joining us for this awesome conversation. Hello and welcome to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. This is your host, Greg Payne, coming at you from Studio 12. This podcast is about being the best possible grandpa you can be, focusing on what it is to be a grandpa and how we can all share that experience together for our grandchildren. Sylvia, thank you so much for being on the Cool Grandpa Podcast. I really appreciate you cutting out some time out of your day to sit down with us and, and have a conversation about your grandfathers and your writing. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy to be here. i um, very happy to talk about my grandparents, my grandfathers, and as well as my dad as a grandfather. Sure, sure. Now, as we get started with this, it's been interesting to get to know you a little bit and then get to know your grandfathers a little bit. But can you introduce your grandfathers to us and give us some of their history? Because it's it's really fascinating history. Sure. 
Well, basically, um, both of my grandfathers um, were pretty high level generals um, in China during the early, uh, you know, 1900s during the like, well, basically, like during the World War II era and a little before that. Uh, my my parents were both immigrants to the United States, and I was even I eventually was born in the United States. So my grandfather on my mother's side, his name is Fan Hanjie, and he's actually very well known. Um, he was one of, of the high level um, generals who was right hand man of um, General Chiang Kai Shek of um, the Kuomintang. Both of my grandfathers were on um, the Kuomintang or KMT side, um, so they were the ones who in the civil war with China, uh, fought against the communists. And um, my grandfather on my dad's side, my um, his name was Liu Yiguang, and he wasn't as high ranking, but he had a very interesting story as well, which I'll share in a little bit. Um, I can talk about, I oh, don't know yeah. which one you want me to talk well, about first. <laughs> let, let, let's talk about your mother's father, Lieutenant General. Let me see. I'm going to try my pronunciations, but I, Fan Hanjin. Yeah, Fan Hanjia. Yep. Okay. Leah, let's let's introduce him a little bit more and, and talk about his story. Um, sure. I actually um should have like reminded myself more detailed of his early years, but basically he um went into a very well known military academy called Wampo Academy, but he entered really late um in his relatively late in his life. So he was sort of about 30 when he entered, and you know, everybody else was like 20. Um, but so he pretty much, um, you know, kind of ascended to leadership positions pretty early on. And he ended up basically um, becoming a pretty high level general in the KMT side. And he was the one in charge of the northern sector um, during the civil war um, against the communist China, but also during World War II, when um, the communists and the KMT allied with each other to fight the Japanese. So he was in that, those, those, um, battles as well. Right. So, yeah. Cause I think I was reading, uh, your, your blog from years ago and he was up in the Manchurian area where really the whole Japanese invasions and, and everything had really started out. Right. Right. And he was, um, definitely like some, some very interesting stories. Like he ended up getting, um, one of the um, the highest U.S. medal that was awarded to you know non citizens um, during the time it was like a the silver palm I believe. Right, I think uh, it was you were saying it was the U.S. Medal of Freedom, the silver palm, which is right. the the absolute highest for a citizen a, a non service medal. Right. And so what's, what's um, actually, so he's one of my grandfathers who I've never met because he actually, in 1948, was captured by um, the communist side when um, the communists defeated um, the, the Kuomintang. And during that period, 1948, is when my grandmother took her kids, which is my mother and her brothers, um, and they fled to Taiwan. So in about 1948, that was the last time my my mother last saw her father um and he ended up um, being kept under sort of like first under political arrest and then house arrest and then event like he was he was um um, sent to re-education camps and so sort of his the rest of his life until the early 80s he basically was under some kind of you know sort of semi-political arrest but he ended up um sort of continuing to help um, the Chinese government because they used, they relied on him for, you know, some of his military experience and strategy. Right. And it was interesting to read too in, in your blog about how he was protected during uh, the social revolutions and things that were going on in the late sixties and how he was really shielded by, uh, I guess, friends that he had had at the Academy that may have gone, I think, one of them went on the communist side, but then later they connected and he was protected by that friend. Right. And what um, also what was interesting was um, like when he was sent um, to a community farm to be sort of reeducated, this is just sort of like a fun fact. 
um, he actually met and befriended Puyi, the last emperor of um, China. And so the two of them became friends in their old age. They kind of, you know, sat together and washed their clothes together and, you know, right. <laughs> um, hardened and stuff like that. Yeah, no, that that's fascinating how he was valued by uh, the communists enough that they kept him around and then that they did include him in some of their council meetings. And he was an advisor, even though he was under this, um, like a captive state or, right. you know, but, but they recognized the value that he brought to the country and, and to the, the people that they were trying to rebuild a government. Right. And I was actually just talking to my mom, mom the other day that it's actually sort of unusual because he very well could have been also executed when he was first captured, you know, so his fate could have been could have gone very differently. Absolutely. And it, there must have been at least a little bit of uh, some kind of respect on the side of the communists that he had been fighting earlier, whether it was treatment of captives or. Uh, you know, just an honorable person or, or whatever for him to have been able to escape, like you said, uh, being captured and then executed. Right. And then like towards the end of the light, his life, um, um, China sort of opened up its um, policy a little bit more for family members to visit from Taiwan. My mother never saw him again, but one of her brothers did. So, um, but that was the only contact he had with any of his kids, you know, over, you know, 40 plus years. That's incredible. One of the stories that I enjoyed reading from your blog, and we'll be sure to put a, a link to this as well so people can go in and check it out, was that I think it was early or or before the, the really fighting with the Japanese came in that he had overrun one of Mao's uh, camps and had discovered suitcases full of history books that were 1,500 years old. They were written back in, I think, 800 AD or so. Uh, right. That was an interesting story. Did you have any other information about that story? Uh, not really. All of this, these sort of family stories came mostly from one of my uncles, who's our family historian. But um, yeah, the, the, the thing that was interesting that he recalled was that, you know, in the middle of the battlefield, here was Mao Zedong carrying trunk full, trunks full of, you know, thousands of year old <laughs> history books. Right, right. As a, as a history buff and, and a, a book guy, I can kind of relate to that. But then on the other side of the practical of, you know, what do you need to carry around in a battle or, or war? I'm not right. sure where that balances out. So, right. Like you can imagine the retinue, right? Of, well, now we have to carry this right. <laughs> trunk full of books. <laughs> right. Do we, do we bring these crates of food or trunk full of books? You know, yeah. how, how does that work? But no, fascinating stories there. And then um, how about let's talk a little bit about your, your father's father. Yeah, so my father's father, Liu Yiguan, he was sort of in charge of essentially what was the equivalent of like the Secret Service. Um, and um, basically, um, I have to give you a little bit of a historical, a brief uh, history lesson. Sure. But there is a very famous um, incident um, in China called the Xi'an Incident. And that was um, during the point when at one point during the Civil War between um, the communists and the Kuomintang, um, the communists were at a very like weakened state um, and they could have been um, eradicated. But um, what happened was there was this um, young, uh, a young general, they called him young marshal, uh, Zhang Shui Liang. He's a very well-known figure in China. Um, he basically worked under Chiang Kai-shek. He was one of his subordinate um, generals, um, but he was very, um, he was very, um, he wanted to, his goal was to have the um, Kuomintang not fight the communists, but instead have them unite together, ally together to fight the exterior threat of the Japanese. And so in order to accomplish that, what he did was he actually kidnapped Chiang Kai-shek um, and basically held him for several days until Chiang Kai-shek agreed. So he basically forced the alliance between the communists and the Kuomintang um, against the Japanese. And so Chiang Kai-shek did that. And that really was like the turning point in terms of survival of the Communist Party, because that gave the Communist Party time to regroup, to develop, 
And basically they weren't under you know, attack anymore by the Kuomintang. They could have been pretty much decimated at that point. Basically, right now, um, communist China, even in the history books, they viewed this man, Zhang Zhuiliang, as a hero, right? He, at a critical point in Chinese history, ensured the survival of the Communist Party. Um, and then we all know what happened since then, right? The whole right. of China right. <laughs> changed. So anyway, but when Chiang Kai-shek got released from this you know, kidnapping Xi'an incident, he turned around and arrested his you know, basically from his perspective, an insubordinate rebellious guy who, you know, forced him to do something he wasn't, you know, really wanting to do. Um, so he made, he put this guy under sh- house arrest. And the, the part that my family comes into it is that my dad's father was put in charge of basically, he was his jailer, you know, he was in charge of like keeping him under house arrest. And so what that meant was my grandfather got this huge like retinue of, you know, soldiers, and they would basically commandeer a compound in a town and they would set up shop, well, set up a a living situation where um, Zhang Shui-Liang, which is the political prisoner, lived with first his wife, but then later on as the years went by with his mistress and under the roof of um, my grandfather. And then my grandfather's family would either live within that compound or next door, basically very nearby. But what happened is during, so this house arrest ended up being the longest house arrest in any like world history. It was 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, my my dad's father was in charge of 25 years of that. So half of that's house, house arrest and half of it was in China and half of it was in Taiwan. And so it was during the years of the war with against um, Japan. So when Japan was sort of basically attacking them and bombing them and basically harrying them, they moved every like year or so or half a year. So my dad grew up um, from age five to 30, basically um, knowing this man. And um, they moved you know, from place to place all around China, um, sort of chased by the Japanese. And then when the communists took over, they moved that whole operation to Taiwan and, you know, basically ended up in Taiwan. So my dad ended up writing a memoir about this in Chinese, and I'm helping him translate it. But that's another super interesting, um, you know, part of my story. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. I was reading just the couple of page introduction that you had sent over to me. And it's reading like it it would be just a, a fascinating movie. I mean, to your point, your family, you know, this this guy's under house arrest and living with your family. And I think there was even, you know, just in the brief discussion about how many times they had meals together. I think there's pictures of everybody together, including the mistress, yeah. if, as like it was a family photo, you know, right. type I mean, of thing. They had a lot of meals together. And, um, you know, my grandmother was the one who prepared the meals. And so a lot of the the meals were family meals. And, um, but it was an interesting relationship because it wasn't purely like a happy relationship because obviously he's still a political prisoner. So um, my dad, when describing it, said his dad used to talk about it as both a friend and an enemy. So basically the original frenemy. (laughs) Right, right. You know, because this guy essentially is the one that tipped the scales to allow the communists to regrow in strength and then eventually take over China. Right. And yeah, it's it's a very complicated relationship, to say the least. Right. And my dad's father had um, basically instructions that you got to keep him safe, but also, you cannot let him escape. And so he basically had implicit directions like, you know, do whatever you have to if he escapes, you know. So there's always the tension. <laughs> sure, sure. No, that that's an interesting story. And like I said, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing that I think once it's translated over into English and, and gets out, it's going to be a really interesting read for people. Yeah. So I've been working with my dad on translating that to um, hopefully, um, you know, have that published yeah, relatively that, soon. <laughs> that's awesome. Now, knowing who your grandfathers were and then not really having contact at all with you, with your, your mother's father. And I think you met your, your father's father uh, one, time. one time. How is that 
how has their story affected you? And, and I don't mean affected like in a negative sense, but how has it maybe impacted you? Um, I do feel like it's always, um, you know, we grew up hearing these, these stories, although like when we were young, it, it didn't sink in, you know, how, how like, you know, cool or important or, you know, impactful, they actually had, you know, their part in history for us. It was sort of like, I, I think I sort of grew to appreciate their historical importance later on, you know, when I was older, but when I was younger, like, I think I just always made me feel very connected to history, to Chinese history, um, to my parents' like immigration story, um, you know, because they had to leave China because of all of that, they ended up in Taiwan. And then they eventually ended up in the United States, which um, is where they met. And so I always felt like a very um, strong connection to my like ch- sort of Chinese roots through oh, them. Absolutely. Well, and, and you think about the difficulties that they had, because I think that it sounded like they came from fairly well off uh, families. Initially, they rose to levels of importance within the government and then went through World War II in the fight against the Japanese, you know, having to leave everything behind and get to Taiwan and then eventually parts of your family immigrating to the U.S. Just an, an interesting story of overcoming a lot of, a lot of obstacles and, and, you know, a little bit of, I don't know, stick to it, stick to itiveness. Yeah. Maybe. And I do think like both of my grandparents, um, well, my grandmother and grandfather, they came from more wealth than, uh, on my mother's side than my father's side. But I think all of them really bought into the whole idea of education, you know, and I think that really translated to my parents, um, you know, the, the importance of education and they went to graduate school. And so that like that was a through thread in our whole you know life, my sister and me as well. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Well, and, it, you know, helps to segue us a little bit because part of your background was Harvard Law, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so it's it's interesting because, folks, you know, I, I looked up and, and connected with Sylvia a little bit because of uh, the children's book that she did. But then her background is really interesting from environmental law and spending a number of years practicing that. And, and going through. So how about you talk to us a little bit about your, let's say the, the lawyer years, let's call them. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, so sort of just backing up a little bit before the lawyer years, I actually ended up growing up in South America. So our story kind of ended up, um, my, my dad ended up uh, working for a, an engineering firm in Caracas. And so I grew up in Caracas, Venezuela. Um, so I had a very, um, so, so I thought that was a, like I had a really interesting upbringing because it was very international. And I think having all that would, made me a good candidate when I went to college, you know, which um, basically w- w- I went to Yale and then eventually Harvard. So I think that that whole like sort of background helped, you know, sort of steer me into that direction. I ended up going into environmental law because I was always interested in the environment and I wanted to work on policy issues and Sort of at the time, I thought, well, it would be nice to have a law degree. Um, it seems like that was an effective way uh, to make policy changes. And it turned out it was. I worked for over 10 years, first in the Department of Justice, uh, doing environmental law within the Environment Division there in D.C. Um, basically, the Department of Justice is the lawyer for the federal governments. So we represented both like the enforcement agencies like EPA, you know, enforcing the Clean Air Act. But we also represented the action-oriented agencies that got sued on environmental um, um, issues, like for example, like the Navy, or you know, um, when their activities impacted the environment. So it was a very interesting mix of um, things. And then um, also, um, Department of Justice also represents the U.S. Um, when it deals with American Indian, Native American issues. So I got to deal with that as well. Oh, wow. And then I ended up um, segueing into a nonprofit called Oceana that worked on ocean conservation. So I did that the last four or five years of my legal career. Oh, very cool. And th- I bet you had a wealth of different types of cases and different types, you know, just circumstances that, that yeah, pop up. I mean, up. it was interesting because I did both um, appellate cases, which is like, you know, arguing before after, you know, the district level, the appellate court level, 
Um, so with a lot of like arguing regulations, um, I even did a few briefs for the Supreme Court. So that was really interesting. And then, um, but I also did um, legislative work. So like working on legislation to improve coral, um, like uh, illegal wildlife smuggling, things like that. Oh, wow. Um, and I did the same mix of things as a lawyer for the nonprofit world. We, um, the Oceana from that side, we tended to sue the government though um, for, you know, their regulations not being protective enough. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. So yeah, you, you, you work both sides of that. A little yeah. bit, a uh, little bit like being a prosecutor and defense attorney, uh, right? Not exactly <laughs> the same, right? Not exactly the same, but but similar as far as being on either side of the uh, the side of the court. Yep. So so yeah, um, and then I don't know if you want me to segue into how then I ended up writing for children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because the, like I said, the, I kind of found you and discovered you was. Uh, the children's writing and the middle grade writing that you were doing, and especially the the morning with grandpa. But let's talk about a little bit about that transition overall from from going from writing legal briefs and, and writing legislation to picture books. Well, what's interesting is actually I should also go back a little. The answer goes back to um, in college, I was always interested in art. But I was also like very practical and being the daughter of immigrants who, you know, like the focus was more on, you know, like, like our mentality, both mine and my parents was, you know, like getting an art degree will not necessarily like, right. like pay the rent that or doesn't whatever. pay the bills. Exactly. Um, right. It probably would have, but, you know, basically I had also bought into the whole idea of, you know, I need a respectable profession and I was interested in doing environmental work. So it worked out fine. But even um, back when I was making that sort of life decision in my mind, I was thinking, well, in the future, someday, you know, I'd love to go back to my original um, um, love of art. And so when um, my kids were young, this was like 10 years into my law career, um, my kids were three and one. It, I, you know, I, I was also drawn to like, I would like to stay at home and spend more time with them. And so that sort of seemed to be a natural time when I was like, okay, I can stay at home. Um, I sort of went part-time and then slowly from part-time went to completely staying at home. But at that point I decided, well, I'm going to give a, a go. I'm going to try to do children's art and illustration. And so I did that for several years and um, that led me to writing picture books um, because as an aspiring illustrator, you want to, you tend to want to illustrate either, you know, you, you can only illustrate things in the public domain, you know, or your own stories. It's hard to like take someone else's story to illustrate. And so I started writing my own stories and uh, taking classes, um, getting connected with other, you know, uh, creators. And I ended up um, writing several picture books and my picture book, A Morning with Grandpa, was a result of, I entered a contest sponsored by Lee and Low Books, which is a, a New York publisher that focuses on diverse stories. And the story is the story of a Chinese grandfather who teaches his um, granddaughter how to do Tai Chi. Uh, tai Chi is, you know, a slow form of meditation and exercise that you often see um, people out in the parks, you know, doing. Right. And then in return, the... Um, the girl teaches the grandfather yoga and then like the twist in the story is that he she's too like hyper to really get tai chi and he's too like inflexible to really get yoga but they end up enjoying you know them each other <laughs> yeah um, yeah no that was i i liked it how it was describing the uh he was doing i think he was doing down dog and, but, but it was talking about his knees being so creaky right? <laughs> and things. And it was like, Oh, when I'm at yoga class, I can relate to that. Right. And so the, he, that story was actually really inspired by my dad who does Tai Chi and he also does Qigong, which is another meditative practice. And so he, when my kids were young, like four or five, six, seven, he would teach them how to breathe and they just loved you know, being with him. And so I tried to capture that whole fun dynamic. Yeah. Now, does your dad live close by with the grandkids? Um, so they didn't for most of the time we grew up because we ended up on the East Coast and my parents, uh, re my dad retired in California. But um, just recently, a year and a half ago or two years ago, they moved right near us. So now they're 
together. But now my my kids are past the age of like you know right. <laughs> they're they're teenagers now. <laughs> right, they're they're in that they're in their own world at this point. Right. Yeah. But yeah, so w- whenever we would visit them, you know, the the few times we did, it was always fun to see my dad interact with them. That's great. Well, and I I love the fact that he was not only he was probably down playing around with them and things like that, but then also taking time out to show them a little bit of life practices and some meditation and some breathing and, and, and some of those things that can definitely help kids, whether they've got anxiety or just a, a skill set or, you know, something that they can take with them throughout their life. Yes, definitely. I mean, I, when I do school visits around this book, that's one of the things I always start off with. I give all the kids, you know, a breathing exercise and, you know, it's, it's something that just, you know, calms anybody. So. Oh, absolutely. And I love to the intergenerational um, aspect of it because there's so many uh, kids books and it's, and I'm not trying to knock kids books, but there's so many that are just, uh, you know, farm animals or race cars or trains or, or something like that, that finding books where you have either grandmothers and granddaughters or, or grandfathers and, and grandkids together is not super common. Right. Actually, now that you mention it, it's kind of interesting. I have two um, middle grade books coming out. Um, middle grade is for, you know, readers about um, eight to 12 year olds, 12 years old. And now that I think of it, both of those stories have a grandparent figure in them. Um, so one is um, so so it's interesting that like I di- it didn't even occur to me till you just said it that I actually have that theme in all my books. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 funny how those uh, show up. And uh, I was talking with uh, Jean Willis. She's a British children's author, and she had a great relationship with her grandfather, knew him very well. But she talks about in some of her books that she sits down and starts writing. And then all of a sudden he shows up as a character. He's been passed for a number of years, but she, she finds it interesting that, you know, she sits down to write something else. And then all of a sudden she says, my grandfather shows up and, and all of a sudden he's in, in the book. That's great. (laughs) Yeah. And I, and, and my grand, in in the case of my middle grade books, they're grandmothers, not grandfathers. Sure. Um, but the grandmothers all like play a key role in, you know, like key moments to help the character. (laughs) Oh yeah. I I love the idea of, of having the grandparents, uh, grandmothers or grandfathers having that kind of an influence, because I think too, is we focus so much on whether it's the individual child in the story, just figuring something out or being led by somebody else. And again, I'm not knocking any of that stuff, but I, I like the idea. And of course, because this is the cool grandpa thing, right? Is having that grandparent be somebody that can show up and, you know, have an influence on the character development or the character perspective or the story a little bit. Right. I mean, one of the sort of tropes you always hear about, especially like in middle grade, um, are that like parents are usually absent, you know, in right. stories like you, you see that in Disney movies as well. And like the reason writers generally do that is because the the goal is to have the, the main character, the kid be the hero, the agent, the one who's, you know, solving their own problems. So generally, like parents tend to be very absent <laughs> in a lot of these stories. And, um, and so that kind of happened with my stories, but I, I did, you know, end up having other adult figures, you know, and those other adult figures tended to be the grandparent. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I think that's kind of the, um, was it the formula of the hero's journey is a little mm-hmm. bit of, I mean, you see it in the old, uh, stories, you know, you got the wizard, you got the old hermit on the side of the road, you got whatever, that hidden right, so the wise older person, right? <laughs> right. That that's in there that that you know reveals a piece of key information, but allows the the hero, you know, whether it's a child or or an adult, to continue on to uh, win the day. Right. Well, Sylvia, what what other books and what other activities do you have coming up? Well, so um, I have so I have a middle grade um, book that's coming up in 
coming out in less than a month, um, beginning of August, August 3rd from Scholastic. It's called Manatee's Best Friend. So it's the story of a shy 12 year old girl in Florida who has to overcome her shyness and also deal with the fallout of an accidental viral video, which you know makes her anxiety much worse oh, <laughs> um, in an effort to save um, manatees. So um, she loves manatees. So it's a, it's a, you know, like a empowerment of girls plus animal, um, you know, story. Oh, very cool. And uh, is that a link that's on your website? It should be like if you open the first page of the website, it's it's up there. Okay, and and folks, we're going to put links to to Sylvia's website um, in the show notes, and we'll be providing all that information where you can find the books and order them, and you know just stay connected with what Sylvia is doing, and especially the the blog post that she had about her grandfather. We'll be sure to even highlight that as its own separate link. Sure. And then the other book that I have coming out is a year from uh, now in June 2022, and it's a middle grade science fiction book uh, from Razorbill, um, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House. And the premise of that is that teens in this near futuristic world, when they turn 13, they get their brains connected to the multi-web, essentially the Internet. <laughs> And my um, main character is a girl who is 12. So she's in the like cohort right before that group. Right. Um, and she and her friends discover a conspiracy against her group of um, friends um, about to be connected to the internet. And it's, um, it's, and she, she fears that her mother, who is a genetic scientist might be behind the plot. So it's kind of a Ooh. action adventure, high tech uh, sci-fi. <laughs> wow. Well, that sounds interesting. And especially when the mother might be the bad guy. Right. <laughs> and then the grandmother plays a, a key role in that story. And so there's like tensions between the mother and the grandmother. But, you know, the grandmother's relationship with my main character is really uh, a, a nice one. <laughs> oh, awesome. That sounds great. Uh, anything about your grandfather's or about your writing that maybe you wanted to share that I didn't ask you? Um, I, I may have some more information about my mom's grandfather, but I, I don't have it really handy. So if I have more, can I like share it and give it to you later? <laughs> oh, abs absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess one of the things is, um, and I think I may have been, I have may have told you when we talked previously was that, um, even though I never had a, like, I didn't have a really strong, like day-to-day -day relationship with my grandfathers or my grandparents, like I can tell they had an impact, a strong impact on my own parents' lives. And so like, I, I get a lot of their lessons from my parents, you know, like oftentimes my mom will say, oh, this is, you know, something my mom always said, you know, or, or my dad will be like, this is, you know, a recipe from, you know, my mom or my, you know, so, so I really do still feel connected um, in a lot of ways with my grandparents, even though, you know, my, my grandfather, on my mom's side, I never met my grandparents on my dad's side. I only met once for my grandfather and twice for my grandmother because they were in Taiwan and they lived in Venezuela. And at that time, we didn't have that much money to travel a lot. So we only traveled once every you know, six years or right, so. Right. Um, and then my grandmother on my mother's side, it was the one I saw the most. And that was only three times. So. Yeah. But it, it's amazing how food and recipes can tie those generations together. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, there's there's one like very simple recipe that we do, um, which is just we call it strawberry mush, <laughs> where you just take strawberries and you mush it with a fork, you pour some milk and you add sugar to it. It's like a really sweet and, you know, like delicious like thing to eat. We usually eat at breakfast, but that's something that my mother's mother, so my grandmother used to make, but she learned from her mother. So it's like one of the only family recipes I know that goes back four generations. <laughs> right. Oh, and, and such a tasty treat, especially, I guess, uh, when, you know, you have to wait at that point for strawberries to be in season and then you have a few weeks to enjoy it. Right. I know we're so spoiled now, right? <laughs> right. Right. It's like, yeah, I can go get strawberries in December or strawberries in, you know, middle of summer. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, like growing up, um, strawberries, um, they don't grow in Venezuela. So they only grew in one little mountain town called, um, that was a German town. So it was like settled by German immigrants. So like maybe every like two years we'd go visit this German town, you know, look at the clocks and, and then buy strawberries. <laughs> so growing up, I only had strawberries like a dozen times and that was always a treat. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. That that's interesting. Well, Sylvia, thank you so much for being on the cool grandpa podcast. I've really enjoyed meeting you talking about your grandfathers and talking about your, your stories and your writing. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Hi, Sylvia. Welcome back to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. I know uh, we haven't even published our episode and we're doing a little bit of an addendum just so that we can get all the facts and everything straight about your grandfather. So this is great talking to you again. It's been nice to have a few days for me to even think about our conversation. So this is great having you back on and making sure we get the record straight about your grandfather. Yes, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I had uh, after I got off the call with you last time, I realized I just had a few of his dates and ages wrong, and his uh, his career was a little vague, and so I just went back and did a little more research, and now I have some more information. Oh, that's awesome. The grandfather we're talking about, and I want to make sure I get the pronunciation as close to correct as I can, is is Fan Hanji. Yeah, Fan Hanji. Yes, Fan Hanji. How about we go ahead and start back with a little bit of the introduction again and and just kind of talking a little bit about the age, I think, when he went into the service academy and some of his his record. Yeah, I mean, basically, he spent his career as um, in the army, but he actually entered. It was a pretty famous um, academy called Bon Po Military Academy that was founded by Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And uh, he entered at age 28. Um, it was the, actually the inaugural class, but he was a, one of the oldest cadets who um, went to, the, to that um, school. Oh, wow. Okay. So it, that's interesting, too, that he was so old because normally we think of military cadet or military age youth going to schools like this anywhere from maybe 16 typically into maybe early 20s, because by the time they're mid 20s, they're out the first lieutenant or, you know, very young officers at that point. Right. He actually had a brief military career because he actually at age 13 went to an army school and then he went to another like surveying school. So when he graduated from that, he was a junior officer um, for a local army unit. And then he went to this academy. So, yeah. Oh, interesting. That that would be in and I think to help make the the connection for me anyway, it would be similar to somebody that maybe had gone to a VMI or a Citadel, came out, served a couple of years, and then uh, was asked to go back into West Point or Naval right. Academy He's, or, or yeah, something like, along those lines. Like, like officer training, right? <laughs> right. That's, that's really interesting. Um, were there other aspects that we wanted to get in and, and talk about? Um, well, I guess just one of the things sort of I mentioned that, you know, I didn't know my um, grandfather very well, but as I talked to my uncles and my mom, you know, none of his kids actually even knew him that well because he was so um, involved with um, the military life his entire life, you know, and he ended up being stationed all over China. And uh, I guess when he graduated from the academy, he was sent um, to the northern um a central northern China to pacify the warlords. And then later on, he was assigned to um, the 19th Army, which is a pretty famous army because they were involved in a coup, attempted coup against um, Chiang Kai-shek, but not my grandfather, his, his, the head of that army did. Okay. Um, and then he also went abroad for a couple of years to, um, to Japan and Germany to study military strategy. So he had a very um, interesting kind of like military career. Well, and you touched on something too that I had forgotten about, but I'm a little bit of the of a history junkie, which was that a lot of, or there was enough of a Chinese officer exchange program with the Germans in the 20s and 30s, and then also with the Japanese prior to that, where I think China was undergoing a modernization program and they were, to your point, they were trying to pacify the warlords and the different kind of breakaway provinces 
And at that time, I, I know Germany was still looked upon as one of the premier groups that you sent people to for kind of war college experience. That It's really fascinating that he had that that experience of going to those two different countries that would then become belligerents during the war. Right. And I, and I didn't actually know that you just taught me something, you know, about how they were seen that way and were, you know, seen as a place to go to get educated. Right. <laughs> right. Right. It's weird because I, and, and the reason it, it, it sparked a memory with me and we're not, we won't spend too much time on it is because I have seen old war footage with, Chinese soldiers in German uniforms. I had a professor that, you know, explained a little bit more of that background of where some of that equipment had been coming from. Yeah. So anyway, um, I guess that that pretty much catches um, us up to sort of what I talked about last time we spoke. And um, I guess the only other correction I'll make is um, I wasn't quite sure on the date of his death. And he died in 1976 at age um, 82. Wow. Sorry, just making but, some notes here for my... Right, but uh, he had last seen my family in 1949. That was when he was captured. Oh, and I guess, you know, we talked a little bit about after his capture. So he was a prisoner of war for 12 years. And then um, in 1961, he was officially pardoned. But then our family found out later on that um, he was, in fact, um, put under house arrest so, and then that was also when, as we talked about, he was assigned to work for the government of China. It was um, it was called the National Council of Political Coordination and Cooperation. And he was sort of like a standing committee member who, I guess, advised well, that, on that. That's a mouthful right there. That yeah. was, uh, <laughs> I always uh, get a chuckle out of some of the old Soviet era and, and the older Chinese uh, committees on 15, right. <laughs> you know, 15 words later. Um, yeah. The thing that struck me thinking about this interview, you know, having a few days on this is the fact that your grandfather, even though he had been captured, um, had served as the POW, continued to serve China. I mean, even though the regimes changed, that he took his experiences, uh, what he had learned and continued to serve even under a different regime instead of just he probably had an opportunity just to keep his mouth shut, uh, you know, work on the tomato garden and keep as low profile as he could. But by being an active member of that committee, he continued to serve the people of China, even, even during the regime, during the change. Yeah. And like, you know, for me, I don't know anything about those years. So I always wonder, you know, like, what was he thinking? You know, was right. he, you know, did he have a change of, hard or mind or not. You know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. And it, it, and it's very hard because there's no diary. There's no documentation. Anybody that would have known him has probably passed or isn't able to communicate uh, with what had happened. But I think maybe it's the grandfather in me that is thinking that given the situation that he had, he could do the most good for the most people by offering wisdom, advice, you know, may not agree with the government, may not agree with some of the things going on, but if he could have some influence, uh, then he was going to use what he could and uh, and do the best he can with that. Right. And I'm sure he had, you know, he was a smart person with an active mind and, you know, you want to keep that busy, right? You don't want to just sit around. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It's, it's almost, you, you know, it, it, if you're an artist, you can't help but paint, you know, right. and, and if you have that wisdom and you have that, that service oriented, uh, heart, you can't help but offer opinions and guidance and, and hopefully it's taken. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for, you know, giving me the opportunity to speak a little bit more about my grandfather. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. This was, this was fun to have a little ad addendum episode to, to our conversation. So as we wrap up again, any last thoughts, any, any impressions since we last talked? I guess not just that, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for this opportunity because I was able to reflect on you know, my grandparents, my grandfathers, but also my dad, how he is with my kids. So, you know, it's really just a nice way to, to think about, you know, family ties and, and, you know, what influences us. Oh, sure. Well, Sylvia, I really appreciate your time jumping back on the call with me. And, uh, and thank you so much for being on the Cool Grandpa podcast. Thank you. <laughs> 
Wow, what an interesting conversation with Sylvia. I really enjoyed getting to know her grandfathers and learning more about her life as an environmental lawyer and how she's transitioned and has so many different phases of her life. It's really inspiring to know that, you know, we don't have to just stay as one thing, that that we can be fluid in our lives and move from, you know, not just an interest to interest, but career to career and how that can impact so many different people in so many different ways. One of my big takeaways from this was thinking in terms of how my decisions, how I'm leading my life is not just going to impact my sons and their families, but also my grandkids, right? And how some of the things that I can do and how I can put in place, uh, in lack of a better word, legacy, can impact them and maybe even be a little inspiring down the road. Now, I don't want to get too heavy on you, so you know, be sure to let me know what your big takeaway was from this conversation. I'd really love to hear how you guys were thinking this interview went and then also thinking, you know, what did you guys get out of it? What was your big, oh, this is something important for me to think about? So shoot me an email or go to my webpage and leave me some comments on these show notes. And again, please go and check those show notes out so you can uh, connect with Sylvia. You can see the books that she has coming out. And then also follow her and um, check out all the different things that she has going on. And if you're around in that Norfolk area, Virginia area, maybe you can even book her for a school visit. So until next time, remember to stay cool. Thank you for listening to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do me a favor and share it with a friend. That's the best way you can help us to expand our community, as well as get the news out about how valuable grandpas are in the lives of those kids. If you'd like to leave me a comment or shoot me a potential topic for this uh, podcast, please go to www cool-grandpa.us look for the comments tab fill it up hit submit it's as easy as that until next time remember to stay cool